Yeah, thank you, Andre, uh, for the introduction. And uh, also for me, it's a great honor to be um, able to contribute to the kickoff of the uh, Georg Nemetschek Institute. I think it's really uh, time that we have something like this in Germany and that we uh, tackle the crucial uh, challenges of digitalization in the built uh, world. Um, yeah, let me immediately start uh, with content and with um, yeah, what is AI and what do we need uh, from perspective of engineering? Um, AI has high potential for buildings and engineers. We've seen that in the past uh, talks, especially to build a more better, more sustainable environment. However, we have uh, major challenges uh, of AI um, to bring it to application, to bring machine learning to application. And there are two important ones I see. The first is the generalization. So how do we make sure that we can apply data from previous models to unseen new cases? That's quite crucial because we are dealing in design, planning, engineering uh, frequently with things that are not existing and uh, AI is applied before they come into existence. And the second challenge is how we need to understand what um, yeah what happens as designers and engineers and we need to check approved results we need to trust results we need to uh, get internal information so that we can improve design configurations or engineering solutions this calls for insight in ai which i'd summarize under the term explainability um, i will explain in my talk uh, how our approach of component-based machine learning contributes to generalization and explainability. And I think um, the method is one method. There are, of course, other methods, but the method is one method to integrate computer science and engineering. And I think that's quite uh, crucial at the moment that we get domain knowledge in it, in these data models that we uh, match uh, structures and uh, data and get both sides together. Next. Yeah, I will use the simplification, uh, design and engineering of energy efficient buildings, because I'm quite similar with that, and my group has high expertise in that field. And energy is uh, especially interesting uh, for generating data models because decisions are taken in early phases to be, or need to be taken in early phases to be efficient. And um, we are quite happy uh, to develop such data different models in um, a DFG researcher unit, uh, early BIM, uh, of which we saw already many colleagues here right now. So, um, what is the current practice of uh, energy efficient uh, design? Currently, uh, physical models are used uh, to predict the energy performance physical simulation models. However, as you see here in these slides, these uh, models are quite complex. They require complex modeling. Due to this reason, uh, if any, only few variants are examined in practice. If uncertainty of early phases where decisions uh, on energy efficiency are best taken are included, then we have uncertainty. And if we then start sampling variants, then we quickly uh, reach a uh, considerable computation time that could uh, take us without parallel computing, high performance computing days to weeks for simulation. However, designers and engineers, of course, need quick response uh, for, from the models. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense to integrate in decision making. Uh, so data models have really high potential to improve that uh, situation. However, we need to address explainability and generalization. What is the current practice of data models in that situation? So state of the art is what we call parametric monolithic models. That means you train uh, or you get training data for such a parameterized model you see on the left, an L-shaped building with length, um, U-value, uh, G-value describing thermal conduction and solar heat gains uh, of the facade. Then you run a bunch of simulations and uh, you get, or if even better situation, you get uh, data from real buildings. And then you train what is shown on the left, a monolithic model, one piece of machine learning can be neural network or something else. And um, if you have trained this with the data, then you get a quick prediction, one millisecond against 
two minute simulation, for example. So the advantage is that you have quick feedback. Um, you don't need to do complex modeling during application. That's ideal for design and uh, decision making. However, such a model is a model for a specific case for that L-shaped buildings, which lacks generalization. If we um, have a image analysis uh, yeah, data model, then we expect it to be able to assign these five doc images to the class doc. The same is for prediction uh, to tasks. So we would expect the model to be able uh, to predict the energy performance of all these uh, types of buildings uh, if you want to apply it really in design. And that's a question the L-shaped building data model is not really able to do that. So um, what do we need uh, to achieve this? And that's the integration of the structures and the knowledge from computer science and from engineering. We need to bring both together um, to be able to have data models that uh, work for such cases. Um, our approach for that integration is that we selected an appropriate uh, structure for decomposing the data model. So we uh, align the data model to typical systems engineering structures and especially energy engineering of buildings. You see here um, the uh, envelope of one piece of a um, component structure, the zone and the building technology with respect to subcomponents, wall, window, floors, roof, and so on. And they are connected by parameters in between. So how do we develop such a data model? How does it work? I would like to show that by window and wall component. Um, we get also training data, either from, yeah, from physical models somehow, either simulation or we test it also on the real data. And uh, we select uh, the data for one component for the wall, for example, that input data is um, the size of the wall, thermal transmission of the wall, orientation of the wall. We pick it from the data uh, base and the output data would be the heat flow for the wall. And then we select one method for uh, surrogate regression model. Uh, and we do it component by component, uh, wall, window, roof, floor, and train the component models. For prediction case, we um, compose the uh, model from uh, the data models we have generated before. And if you want to, for example, represent uh, the energy performance of that piece of the facade, we need two uh, wall components, two window components, plug them together with the respective um, parameters, and then um, we get the heat flows that are required. We do that through the whole uh, hierarchy uh, down to whatever we want to predict, in that case, final energy or CO2 emissions or whatever, and then uh, we quickly get the result. Um, the advantage is that the component structure is aligned to the structure of digital modeling, building information modeling. So if we have a file, IFC data or model in that standard, uh, then we can quite automatically generate the component model of each design. And second, the integration of uh, the data models and uh, the engineering becomes possible by this uh, plug and play uh, approach. So uh, we have um, the boxes in here that are the part of data modeling, computer science, and we connect it uh, together with engineering what is the part that's happening uh, in between. And that way we reach the integration between both. Um, this is a method also that generalizes quite well that I would like to show on this slide. So we were not able to predict only uh, the boxes we used for training, but we are also able to predict performance of these test cases, these uh, arbitrary shaped uh, buildings. And um, if on the right, you see um, a graph comparing the physical prediction, um, simulation and prediction of um, the test cases. And uh, uh, here on the y-axis, you see the prediction by uh, machine learning, by our component-based machine learning approach. And as you see, we have a model that quite well um, is uh, predicting uh, the performance. So the accuracy is uh, more than acceptable for early design phases. 
So um, why is that uh, generalization working well? There, there are two conditions uh, for that. First, we match the data structures. So we have the same the required parameters uh, in it to uh, be able to predict. And uh, we match the data distribution. So input value range and distribution uh, are similar to what is uh, from prediction and the training happening. Um, we checked uh, both. I mean, uh, the matching of structure is simple. If you have a test case here shown on the left, um, then we can plug uh, the connect the components in the right uh, structure we need for prediction, and then we match the structure of our artifact. Furthermore, we checked also the distributions of um, the uh, parameters. And uh, the boxes show uh, distributions. The light uh, dotted, uh, short dotted line is the training data, and the uh, thick, long uh, dashed line is the um, test case data with some variation. And you see here first um, cases in which we quite exactly match the ranges. That is, for example, the U value of the wall. We can select that U value freely, we can control the U value. And then we have other um, parameters for which uh, we can't uh, directly control uh, the parameter directly, uh, such as the area of the wall. Um, but even for that, we see that the matching uh, of the range is uh, quite good. Um, so that means that we uh, match the ranges, and that's quite important. We heard already in many talks before that um, interpolation is quite important, and uh, data models have very limited capabilities of extrapolation. So therefore, it's important to check it and to uh, be able then to trust uh, the model. Um, besides generalization, the component-based approach has its benefits in explainability. Um, I mean, um, if we align our data structure with the engineering uh, structures and with the parameters, we are able to interpret it what's happening in the model in terms of engineering. If we um, do that, then the black box becomes, uh, to some extent, transparent. Um, we can query the same information from the data model as we can query from the simulation model. I will illustrate a bit in detail next slides how we do that. But if you um, compare it with what is happening in computer science, if they look at explainability, um, then they are looking at activations that you can do and you get information from that. And what we do is we transform these activations. I mean, you can uh, interpret the whole component-based model on the right as a big, uh, deep network. And uh, we transform the activations uh, or certain points of activations uh, in the network into engineering interpretable values in the deep network. And from that, it gives us then the precise possibility to look into the network. Um, let's see what we can do if we have that explainability information. Uh, the first uh, thing we can do is look at the flows that happening in between. For us, it's uh, heat flows, um, either as uh, average or as time series. And let's zoom a bit uh, in the time series and see what we can, what information we can get from the time series. Um, here you see at A2, you see the time series of the east uh, walls of uh, the building. And if you look uh, at the peaks in, in uh, A2, you see uh, the sun hitting uh, the building in the morning, all predicted by machine learning here. And um, you see the um, heat flows that are caused later in the day when there's no sun on the wall that um, are uh, caused by the hot air around the building that's in summer. Furthermore, you can see that uh, there is some cooling capabilities of the building overnight. So the wall transfers also heat from inside to outside uh, the building. So that gives us a bit of understanding. If we look at the um, cooling uh, system here in uh, A, you see the um, cooling system. There is a uh, cooling system is turned off over weekend. And if you compare uh, the peaks in the cooling system, you can see that there is a, a load peak uh, on Monday uh, compared to Friday. And uh, that is caused by the um, heating up of the building during the weekend because systems turned off. 
Um, if you if you compare the temperature of flows, they are quite similar if you go back to the heat flows of the world. So that um, tells us that there's something happening, something about the dynamics of the building, the building mass, and that's quite important information um, for the engineers to understand what's really happening. Um, furthermore, we can see in the heat flows of the world that there is day without sun. And um, also at that day in cooling loads, uh, we see that there is also uh, still cooling load present. So that tells us something about the relation of um, air uh, transport or heat transport from air into the building versus uh, sun transport to the building and tells us a bit about the importance of uh, air exchange infiltration against sun um, uh, that is entering the building. So that's some information we can get directly from um, the time series. Uh, that's therefore for that we need uh, one prediction only, one millisecond machine learning, or two minutes um, by <clears throat> by um, simulation. Um, let's see what else we can do if we uh, use advanced technologies of explainability, um, as I applied also in computer science and. Um, uh, fields. So, um, what if we that um, if we want to get more information about the local configuration, then we can do local surrogate models, and local sampling is required for doing local surrogate models. So, if we do local sampling for our variables, we move them one step up, one step down, if two steps per variable that end up easily in hundreds of runs. And that uh, would be 100 milliseconds by machine learning or 200 minutes by simulation. So that explains a bit the importance of doing uh, data modeling to sample design spaces. We have selected two additional methods. Um, first, we selected um, sensitivities. Uh, so that tells us a bit about the, what happens if for a variable. So what happens if you change a variable and directs designers and engineers to uh, important variables in decision making. Furthermore, we have uh, examined local um, trees that provide us with explicit rules how we reach a certain performance. So first, um, that's the matrix of uh, sensitivities that shows the dependencies uh, of um, between key design variables and uh, component flows. Let's zoom in here too. And uh, first thing you see is if uh, we increase length or height of the building, then the uh, heat losses of um, the south wall uh, are re uh, increased by 100 watt on average. But at the same time, the heat gains through windows on the south are increased by 300 watts. So that tells us a bit about the potential to get uh, heat or energy in the building by south windows. However, to um, be sure that it's usable, uh, we need to know if that happens in summer or in winter. And uh, we can look at sensitivities of the G value um, that determines the solar heat gain, the solar heat gain through windows. So if we look at the G value and increase it by 10%, we see huge heat gains um, through the south window, as we would expect it. Furthermore, uh, we see that heating load is reduced. The heating, overall heating load of the building is reduced, and also overall energy demand is reduced. So the windows are really working uh, to collect, to harvest energy. Uh, but we see also that we have uh, considerable cooling loads, and that would bring an engineer then to considerations about external shading uh, for the windows and develop an energy strategy in that way. So that's information we can get from sensitivities. And uh, next slide, I would uh, like to look at what information we can get from trees. That's really recent uh, research uh, results I'm happy uh, to share with you. So we uh, trained a tree also on the same uh, local uh, data, surrogate data that we used for the um, uh, sensitivities. And we did that here for the south windows only. Let's zoom in here too. So um, we see that um, the um, window area and the G value are the most decisive uh, variables for um, the heat flow to the windows too. So that matches what we have seen uh, for sensitivities. 
However, if we go into more detail, then we had a really surprising observation. So if we look at uh, what happens at that level for our prediction, we see that for um, medium-sized uh, windows, this, this is the note here, for the medium-sized windows, um, the U value is important. But if we uh, look at large uh, sized windows here, then we see that uh, the U value is not used uh, for the prediction. And that tells us a bit uh, about uh, importance uh, or rule based uh, importance of um, the uh, energy performance uh, of the building. Um, yeah, I would, I, I could move on uh, uh, for a long time uh, going through uh, the results. Uh, but I would stop here, I think, for the sake uh, of uh, time and conclude. Um, yeah, why do we need methods like uh, component-based uh, machine learning? So we need uh, AI models and data models that are aligned uh, to engineering structures and engineering knowledge. And the component-based uh, machine learning is one method uh, for this purpose. So we've seen that uh, we can achieve generalization by the universal components. So that's something uh, that allows us to reuse um, yeah, data and models that we have learned already. So we can improve them for future, for future cases. Uh, furthermore, we get um, explainability. So we can observe what's happening in the models. We, with these observations, we can draw conclusions. We can check what's happening in there. And that gives us um, access to internal, to uh, the interpretation of internal processes in the data modes. We have done that right here for the um, domain of um, thermal energy engineering. Um, so it, we have proved it for a field with relatively high um, complexity in its processes. Uh, therefore, we expect it to be transferable also to other, uh, many other fields of engineering. And um, I think that also many other fields of engineering are organized in a way that is uh, related uh, to systems and therefore it seems to be well feasible. Um, yeah, thank you for your attention and also thank you to my PhD students uh, who helped me a lot in generating data figures and discussing results and I'm available for questions now.